probably represent one of those scholars who would be one who does not grant the existence of the empty tomb. Is, is that right? Yeah, actually, I'm a, an odd bird to talk with uh, about this because I have almost nothing in common anymore uh, in terms of assumptions here because the more I've looked at it over the years, uh, from starting as, as a InterVarsity and Gordon Conwell, uh, up and coming apologist, the, the less confidence I've, I've had in these things. And I've come to think that I was dealing with the, the uh, whole Easter story as, uh, as the wrong, in the wrong genre. It seems to me now that, uh, by comparison with just a bunch of ancient similar stories, whether you're talking about, uh, miracle stories about Asclepius or apotheosis narratives where, uh, philosophers or godmen, uh, disappear and cannot be found by their searching friends, not a hide nor hair of them, and, uh, sometimes their post-mortem appearances from heaven to convince doubting disciples and all this stuff. I just think there really is no reason to believe we even have historical accounts of anybody's experiences. I mean, I know where this puts me. I know how like Boltman, supposedly the arch skeptic, said, he can't get back further than the Easter morning appearances of, to the first disciples. Well, I'm not sure we can get that far back uh, anyway. I, I don't think we really even have accounts of, of uh, anybody's experiences here. I, every one of these stories strikes me as just cut from the cloth of uh, myth and legend and uh, it would be and, and to a to quote a cartoon I saw recently, I can't think of who did it, uh, to, to argue from the empty tomb to the resurrection of Jesus is sort of like arguing from the yellow brick road to the authenticity of, of the uh, Wizard of Oz. It's just part of the, of the same story. It's, it's not some kind of known fact outside of the story. And, and it all seems to me now, though I love the story, it seems to me to be uh, fictitious. Uh, very powerful and important to me. I don't mean to laugh it off or anything, but it just it, even the, the crucifixion seems so similar to uh, to uh, similar scenes in novels and so forth from the period. I just think it's really all up for grabs. There is no way to know, uh, even if there was a historical Jesus. Though if there was, you know, who knows? All of this, I, I think, like Burton Max says has very likely been generated from the needs of ancient religious communities and modeled on the similar founding myths of other religious communities. So, you know, anything could have happened. There could have been a historical Jesus, could have been an empty tomb, could have been a resurrection, but I just don't think there's any epistemologically or historically sound way to know this. And, and the same thing comes up with the Moses and the Buddha. It's, we just don't have the kind of historical source material to deliver us from agnosticism. All right. Uh, well, Gary and Mike, so if the issue here is genre, what reasons do we have for believing that the stories about the empty tomb are in the genre of history rather than, like Dr. Price says, uh, apiothos narratives? Uh, let, me, uh, let me make a couple comments about Bob, and then Mike's done some work on the genre thing, so let me uh, kick over to him. But just a couple of qualifications. In our discussion here... Um, empty tomb came up first in the discussion, but I don't want to ever give the impression that I think that empty tomb is how the early Christian story started. I think uh, Bob mentioned Boltman, who, by the way, in his famous 1941 New Testament of Mythology, the essay that got demythologization going, Boltman makes a very interesting comment. He says, the only historical fact that we can be positive of after the death of Jesus is that certain disciples believe they saw him alive. Uh, Boltman, now, now I know Bob can distance himself from Boltman. I'm just saying Boltman himself, with all his skepticism, as Bob says, took the appearances, uh, the stories of the appearances that the disciples believed they saw him to be fact. But I think I would agree with Boltman and everybody since him, virtually everybody, that the, the experiences that they believe they had of the risen Jesus, that's what got the ball rolling. And the empty tomb was something, let's say, if it happened, it would be cooperation. They wouldn't start from the empty tomb and then say, wow, what do you know, we have a resurrection. So I want to make that qualification. I would start with the appearances, and I think that's where scholarship is. I think that's where history is. 
And uh, Mike, I'll kick it over to you on the on Bob genre question. I think that, that deals more with the, the various parallels, and I I would I guess I just hand the baton back to you. But in terms of the genre, um, you know, Richard Burridge did a a, a, a dissertation length book. Uh, back in 1992 that was updated just a few years ago, I think in 03, called What Are the Gospels? And he had become disenchanted with works by Charles Talbert and David Olney um, on saying that the Gospels uh, were uh, ancient biography, Greco-Roman biography, and uh, that they contained um, some historical elements in it for certain. And um, so he, he set out to disprove that. He thought these American scholars were just quacks. And he's a classicist scholar, so he had been studying all the, the ancient classics and, and knew what ancient biography was, and so he set out to disprove it. And as a result, he flip-flopped his position completely and agreed with them, although he said that Talbert and Alney were mistaken in some of the things that they said, especially Talbert. Um, he had some words for it, but the... Um, in that, he, he says that this is definitely ancient Greco-Roman biography, or a subset of it, that uh, was no different. Had 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 in terms of when we say a subset, there, you know, it might be different than let's say Apollonius of Tyana by Philostratus or Plutarch's Lives, but it differed from those biographies no more than those other biographies differed from one another. So that's why he called it a subset. Say to put this thing out on the on the floor, we are mentioning here the people who are in the right place uh, at the right time, people who claim to be eyewitnesses, people who claim to have seen uh, appearances. And again, we have just because they claim them doesn't mean they make them true, but that puts them out there to discuss. So the people who had said they had the experiences were there at a very early date, and uh, then if you want to bring the early t- the empty tomb into it a little bit later, uh, you have three things there, the, the uh, eyewitness discussion of the guys in question, the date, and the uh, the tomb itself. So just to get it on the table, I think that's where much of the discussion begins. Well, one reason I, I have a problem with that is the, the stuff that uh, a lot of people, well, virtually everybody, makes pre-Pauline formulae, creeds, hymns, traditions, and so on, all strike me, uh, especially after reading von Manen and uh, some of these these uh, Dutch radicals of the 19th century, it strikes me as, as grossly anachronistic. It seems to the, the very idea that uh, Paul, this pioneer missionary of the dawn age of Christianity, is reminding churches of traditions that he passed on and that he was duly catechized by the Jerusalem apostles with these foundation stones of the Gospels, the, the death according to the scriptures, the resurrection on the third day, the appearances and all this, as a crystallized formula. This strikes me as, as a, a bunch of big signs that these are po- either post-Pauline interpolations or just parts of post-Pauline letters. I've come to, again, I realize I'm way out there, but I've come more and more to think we are not dealing with Pauline material hardly anywhere, but suppose we were. There's a big problem between Galatians and First Corinthians in Galatians, one thing we are not told that he discussed with any anybody during these uh, peer, these uh, meetings in uh, Jerusalem was resurrection appearances. It's an inference from the fact that they're mentioned in First Corinthians fifteen three through eleven that uh, well you know when would he have gotten this data or this creedal statement from the the, the head honchos in the home office and they figure well it must be that uh, meeting described in Galatians in that case what was he preaching before this i mean he says this is the gospel that i passed on to you as of first importance as as was passed on to me uh, well what was he preaching if he received this gospel he doesn't say uh, as harmonists do uh, this was the official formulation of he says this is the gospel i passed on to you i got it the same way well that that can't be from the same guy that wrote in galatians no no human agency gave me my gospel. It just seems to me we have to choose between them, and maybe neither one of them is Pauline. So we we've got to. I just see the thing swimming in difficulties, and I don't know that we even have a. I think even the uh, the First Corinthians fifteen. Uh, 
list, as Harnack pointed out long ago, is already a composite, dogmatic, tendentious, pieced together item and must be uh, long after the historical Paul. So I just don't see, or the, the, well, I could go on and on, but I just don't see this as uh, as likely first-hand evidence. Um, like nobody, no critical scholars think that we have stuff from that John, James, and Peter. I just don't think we have any reason to believe we have any first-hand material from Paul either. Well, Paul. And we're really just out in the... Uh, in the slough of despond in terms of uh, this kind of evidence, which doesn't bother me for the uh, meaning and utility of the documents we're talking about, but uh, historically, I just think we're up the creek on that stuff. Bob, why would Paul... You said this makes you wonder what he was preaching before that time. Um, uh, granted, uh, first his trip to Corinth is, is early 50s, but he says this is the stuff I received... If he's right in Galatians that he went away with the Lord, so to speak, to meditate or whatever on this material and doesn't show his face almost, or at least not widely so, for three years, um, why would he be out preaching before he was preaching? What I mean is if, if the Lord, if he believes this is the same gospel God gave him, and, and by the way, it's not just First Corinthians 15, in several passages he, he defines the gospel, and every time... Uh, deity, death, resurrection are always mentioned. I mean, by deity, I mean a title. But at least as far as historical facts, uh, death and resurrection are always mentioned. Now, my question is, if he emerges after three years with the Lord, Galatians chapter 1, and he goes up to the up to Jerusalem, the Lord's given this to him, he wants to see what the other guys are saying. Um, I guess I'd have two questions. You say, well, what was he preaching before he went up there? He went up there, if Galatians 1 is correct, to inaugurate his public ministry. So he wasn't preaching before that, at least not any great amount that we know of. And and secondly, why would he, you know, your question, he received this from the Lord or he didn't. So the guy who said he didn't in Galatians 1 can't be the guy who said he did in 1 Corinthians 15. Seems to me a real easy answer. I mean, I, I think of Victor Furnesh, who, you know, is no friend of evangelicalism, but Furnesh says in his book, uh, Jesus According to Paul, uh, he says Paul obviously differentiates between a definition of the gospel, which the Lord gave him, and a statement of the gospel, which he thought the other guys there put into a really nice form. They didn't change yeah, it. All of that is read in. Uh, none of that is said. It's it's just driving a distinction in because one needs it to harmonize. In Galatians 2, he actually says, uh, verse 2, I, I went up by revelation and I laid before them, but privately before those who were of repute, the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Right. Right. So Galatians he's one. preaching a gospel, and if we identify this with the time that he got the 1 Corinthians 15 list, right. What was he preaching? Because in First Corinthians 15, here's the gospel oh, but, but that Bob, I preach to you. Bob, Galatians 1 comes before Galatians 2. And so if he's meeting with the disciples at about the 35-year mark, what's wrong with clarifying what the Lord told him, finding out, wow, there's other people in the world who are teaching the same thing I am, especially at this central point, and Galatians 2 is a later statement where he comes back to kind of say, let's make sure we're all on the same page. But Galatians 2, he already got this, uh, A, time with the Lord, alone, not, not just the resurrection appearance to him or what he says, what he believes is that, but he has the resurrection appearance of the Lord. He's alone with the Lord for three years. Then he goes up to Jerusalem. That seems to me to be an inaugurating, uh, a mission or preaching inauguration for him. He didn't get it. You know, it, there's no 10-year gap here. As soon as he comes out of hiding, let's say, he's he's got it from the Lord, he's got confirmation from the eyewitnesses, and he's ready to go. You know, I, I don't... Well, it says here in uh, 118, after three years, uh, I uh, went up to Jerusalem to visit right. Cephas and remained with him 15 days, but I right. saw none of the other apostles except James the Lord's brother. I'm not right. lying, etc. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia, still not known by sight of the churches in Judea. They only heard it said he once persecuted us, now preaching the faith, etc. Then after 14 years, I went up. And it's the after 14 years where he right. says he laid his gospel that he preaches among the Gentiles before the, the big right. 